It's no secret that our country and our families are facing unprecedented challenges from all directions. But one issue that consistently escapes the radar of most people, especially an otherwise bad news obsessed fear industrial complex, is the crisis among boys and young men. According to the Brookings Institute, college graduation rates for males are declining. The UN found that male unemployment is on the rise. And the National Center for Health Statistics ran a poll among men in which nearly one in 10 reported some form of depression or anxiety, but less than half sought any kind of treatment. Whether you're a dad, a mom, a grandparent, or a mentor, the question we need to ask ourselves is how do we help our boys avoid this crisis and thrive? Fortunately, friend of the channel and close advisor, Warren Farrell has spent a half century researching and writing numerous books on the major issues that affect both men and women. His most recent book, The Boy Crisis, goes into great detail about the numerous problems our boys are facing worldwide and what we can do about it. The boy crisis basically resides where dads do not reside. And so these boys don't have a male role model to teach them how to deal with enforced boundaries and therefore they don't have the discipline to be accomplished and they don't have the postponed gratification that is the single biggest predictor of success or failure. According to the 2020 census, one in four American children is growing up without a father or father figure in the home. Our nation leads the world in fatherlessness. That's a record none of us should be proud of. Pile on the blame and shame our boys are bombarded with from the commanding heights of our culture, and you can understand why boys are falling behind. And it's one of the reasons I say the boy crisis is not just a crisis of mental health, physical health, economic health, but it's also a crisis of shame, that our boys are feeling ashamed that they are boys. And you know, whenever only one sex wins, both sexes lose. Warren offers deep insights and practical solutions for what we can do as parents to recognize these problems and help our sons grow into happy, healthy men capable of being involved fathers themselves. As the dad of a teenage son, Warren's work has been incredibly helpful and inspiring. I hope you feel the same. Warren, welcome to Dad Saves America. I'm so looking forward to another day together. <laughs> I guess my first question is, what is the boy crisis? It's a crisis of um, educational problems, mental health, physical health, economic failure, and a crisis of shame as well. And so that's sort of the bigger picture. Um, on the most people are familiar a little bit with the education level, but not quite as much as they could be or should be. On the education level, uh, we now know that there's about 60% of the people that go to college are females and about 40% males, but that's not the worst of it. When men and women go to college, the males are far more likely to drop out of college. Hmm. So within a few years, the male-female ratio of college graduates will be two women per one male. Wow, it's that extreme. It's that extreme, and the extreme is not just a boy crisis. It's going to become or will be a girl crisis as well because there are very few, I have two daughters, there are very few young women who wish to have children and are looking uh, for a male uh, who's uh, on the unemployment line, uh, who has uh, very few female college graduates who are interested in a male who's not a college graduate. And so especially when women have children, they become very particular about who that father will be. And, uh, and males today, are 66% more likely to be living with their parents between the ages of 25 and 31. And so this becomes a crisis for our daughters as well. And you know, whenever only one sex wins, both sexes lose. What's happening in the career and workforce that makes you say that boys are in a crisis? Yes, when boys are far more likely to do worse in school in every single academic subject but especially in reading and writing. And that leads them, therefore, to dropping out of high school much more frequently than girls do. And then when they drop out of high school, they're more than 20% likely to be unemployed in their 20s. And so a 20% unemployment rate is enormous. But these unemployed males are um, not productive in the culture. They're draining the taxes. Most of these unemployed males and boys that are having uh, educational problems, uh, they have in common one major thing. Uh, the boy crisis basically resides where dads do not reside. I want to 
hone in on the the, the workforce for a bit because mm -hmm. we'll get we'll get back to dads because obviously mm -hmm. it's Dad Saves America and that's yes, a big yes. part of why uh, we've been talking to you and why you've been advising us on a lot of mm -hmm. these issues. I read somewhere that today women are now. Uh, outnumber men in total in the workforce. There are more women working in the in absolute terms than men, and that in most um, in most career paths, um, high powered career paths in particular, women now actually dominate men. So if you look at law school students and law school graduates and medical school students and graduates, more frequently now female than male. However, if you look at those women and men. 10 years after graduating from law school or, uh, or medical school, uh, a significant percentage of those females will have children, and oftentimes those, uh, the, the females drop out of the workplace when they're raising the children or cut back significantly in the workplace. So you still have those males on average, the smaller percentage of males putting in more hours in the workplace. But you don't have, for example, in the workplace, um, we have an enormous shortage today of long haul truck drivers. Yeah. And no women are competing, well, you know, maybe 1% of the people who compete for the, to be the long haul truck drivers or are competing for almost any of the hazardous jobs. So 93% of the people that are killed in the workplace are males. Um, and usually it's really worse than that because being a firefighter, for example, a lot of firefighters uh, die in the workplace, but they don't, uh, the, the real problem is remnant diseases from the, the, you know, the remnants of, of constantly taking in smoke and, um, and dying earlier in life, even after they've retired from oh, that's being a firefighter. So, you know, Mike Rowe and Dirty Jobs has really put a lot of work into trying to raise awareness of this, this skills gap that's mm -hmm. happening where we have all these, I think it's tens of thousands, maybe even millions of open positions mm -hmm. in these fields that it sounds like you're saying by and large get occupied by men, but but men aren't taking the jobs. Men are, fewer and fewer men are taking the jobs. We're moving from the old days where survival was everything. And if you had to survive and you were male, uh, when you had children, uh, you started saying, okay, I can't be that musician I wanted to be. I can't be that actor, the writer. I can't teach in elementary school. I love teaching in elementary school, but I'm not gonna make enough money teaching in elementary school or as, as a musician, actor, or writer. So I better take a job that earns more money. So I'm willing to take that job as, um, you know, as, a, as a firefighter, a police officer, and risk my life uh, because I want my children's life to be better than mine. Now, unfortunately, feminists have taken that trajectory and said, okay, there's more as elementary school teachers, superintendents of schools, or principals. This just goes to show you that uh, when women and men are both in a profession, uh, men end up taking over and earning more money. Well, they earn more money not because they want to be a superintendent of schools or a principal. Most, most people that go into elementary school teaching hate administration. It's only when children come along that they realize that as the elementary school teacher, they're not making the type of money that they could as a superintendent of schools or a principal, so they take something that they like less to earn more. As a rule, the more fulfilling the occupation is, the less it pays, because there's a supply-demand issue. The more fulfilling the occupation, the more people want to do it oh, that's in, relation to the, in relation to the demand for it. So most families find that they will need somebody to pick up their garbage more than they'll need access to a, an art history major or a French literature major. <laughs> and so, but you know, obviously about 70, 80% of the art history and French literature majors are female, not male. So um, you had mentioned several other factors one of which is mental health and suicide. Yes. So talk to me about that. When boys and girls are nine years of age, they rarely commit suicide and they commit it at an equal level to the degree they do. Um, between the ages of 10 and 14, boys commit suicide twice as often as girls. Between the ages of 15 and 19, boys commit suicide at four times the level of girls. And between the ages of 20 and 25, boys commit suicide at about five times the rate of girls. That goes back to four times um, for the rest of most, most of the rest of life until males and females get older. When males and females get older, like 85 years of age and yeah. older, 
males commit suicide 1,650% more frequently than their, their female counterparts. Really? Now, the, the important thing about that is, I would guesstimate here, about 98% of Americans don't know that. It does speak to this bigger issue of just the awareness problem of yes. the crisis. Okay, so boys are falling behind educationally. Mm -hmm. Boys are suffering a mental health crisis. Yes. Boys are growing into men who don't enter the workforce at the same rates because they don't graduate from high school and college at the same rates and, and, and for other reasons. But then also we've got incarceration which is connected to all those other things, right? Yes. So tell me about what's happening with boys in incarceration. And at one level, I think everybody knows you look at a prison and it's all men. <laughs> but <laughs> what's happening? There? Yes, we, we have many women's centers and we also have men's centers. And men's centers are basically called prisons. And uh, when I ran for governor of California, I did a number of uh, prison talks. And um, I came after a while to ask a question. I said, raise your hand if you did not have a significant amount of father involvement growing up. And the, depending on the prison, it was somewhere between 85 and 90% of the men said, did not have a significant amount of father involvement growing up. And I would talk to them about the importance of father in, um, involvement. And the re their response was coming up to me these guys with muscles like I will never have, um, <laughs> with um, tattoos and tough, pull me aside, Dr. Farrell, can I talk to you for a minute? You know, I never realized before today that I could be important. I always felt like, you know, probably I was a loser. And I, I never realized that dads were so important to kids. I'm gonna work the rest of my time here to try to get out of here as soon as I can and help my kids not make the mistakes that I made to not have them uh, end up here in prison. Once I told these male prisoners without dads how important dads were on so many different levels, it was like they, they had a sense of purpose. They had it and they felt valued and they felt needed. They wanted to come back and make sure their children were winners. From your perspective, why is it that we don't hear about this in the culture? Like if you search about the boy crisis, you're gonna come up with Warren Farrell. Why is it that this issue is so invisible? First of all, I'll give you an example of how right you are. Men die earlier than women out of, out of 14 out of the 15 leading causes of death. 14 out of 15. And yet we have eight federal offices of men, women's health and none of men's health. None? None, zero. There's a little bit of a part of an office dedicated to Native American male health, but none across the board on male health. And so that just gives you a, a sense of wow. the gap between the problem and the caring. So which leads to your question about why such an enormous gap. And here's why. Throughout history, males served a major purpose. We had two purposes. One was to, um, each generation had its war, and when that war came and could ruin our population, Uncle Sam, or the equivalent thereof in different countries, said, Uncle Sam needs you. What did he need that male for? He needed that male to be willing to be disposable, to risk his life to save the life of others. So, and, and our parents were very proud of us if we went into the Marines or the uh, Army, the Navy, Air Force, on the one hand, and they were also, on the other hand, very fearful of losing us. Yeah. Um, and so... As the dad of a 16-year-old, I think about that. And all the time, of I course. I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want them to go off and die in a war. Absolutely. <laughs> and, but if you were a generation or two in the past, you wouldn't even have thought of you, you, would have, you would have thought about not wanting them to go off and die, but you also would have had so many messages of Hitler could take over the world and without, you know, and without our, if our son can go off and, and maybe be a force in preventing Hitler from taking over the world, uh, you'd, have, you, you'd have mixed feelings. Right, and right. the problem is when you're proud of somebody f for dying in order to save you, it's difficult to emotionally, emotionally attach to somebody that you may lose. Hmm. Our job as a male hmm. was to be disposable in order to save others. There's a, a, still this enormous amount of uh, incentive on the part of um, men to be loved by doing things that make them unloved. That is, men hmm. learn, especially when they're fathers, 
that the Father's Catch-22 is to learn to love the family by being away from the love of the family, traveling, taking a job that's not selling a local product, but selling a national product, no longer being the elementary school teacher, like I said before, but being um, a, you know, the superintendent of schools. And so men learn, especially when they have children, that the mom has the freedom to be a full-time worker, the freedom to be full-time at home, the freedom to do work part-time, but he has the expectation to work full-time and to disconnect from what he loves to do in order to earn more money to be able to supply money for the family. And that dynamic is still going on to such a degree that when we, when we do surveys of women, uh, they say that 72% of women say that they would um, like men to pay on the first date, even if there was a joint decision to have that first date. The percentage of men that agree with that are 81% of the men agree with that. And so, so still men are learning that in order to have romance and love, I have to earn more money than the female is expected to earn. She has the option, I have the expectation. How does that set of expectations that you're laying out, some of which are pretty controversial, that, 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 and I wanna get to some of, that, some of what's controversial about mm -hmm. it, but this sort of behavior you're describing, you're saying, you know, so men are, have been sort of socialized to be disposable. Mm -hmm. How does that result in the boy crisis being invisible? No, we've learned as a result of men playing this role of protector that the, you know, that the, the man will risk his life um, much more frequently. And most of this happens today. Today there's much more freedom for women to be whatever they want to be. And there's beginning to be more freedom for men to be whatever they want to be too, but it's much more cautious in this area. When um, that's true up until the point when men and women have children. So the pay gap, for example, when men and women have children, that's when the pay gap s sets in. That's when men learn to do things that earn more money and women learn to make a choice among three things. If she's a career-oriented woman, she says, I want to work full-time. If she's um, more oriented toward wanting to raise her children, she says, I want to be involved with the children full-time. Or she does some combination of both, works part-time. And so the data on that is pretty clear. 40% of women who are married who have children uh, work full-time, 40% are with the children full-time, 20% um, work part-time. And even the ones that work full-time, they cut back the amount of work that they do, often from like 50 hours a week to 35 hours a week, which is still considered full-time. They tend to work at jobs that are much closer to home so that they can respond to home demands uh, much more quickly. Uh, they tend to put their, um, when there's a family crisis or ch uh, the children uh, have gotten some in trouble in school or something like that, work comes second, the children come first. And for the male, the children come first too, but they come first differently. He's got to be out there um, making more money so that his children can live in a good community, go to a good school, and his children can have opportunities that he has never had before. That's when the pay gap sets in. The pay gap is not between men and women, it's between dads and moms, for the most part. We begin to care less about the person who's not around that often. When the recital comes or the birthday comes and dad is only secondarily there, uh, we don't attach as much to him as we attach to somebody who's um, taking care of the children full time. Uh, the children attach more to that. The mother is given more permission if she has that personality type, she's given more permission to love and be loved. Um, dads are still given more expectation to make sure that the family is in, in supply of good money and money, all, the, the process of earning money so frequently takes you away from loving and being loved. So I, I think one of the things that's challenging in the way you've laid that out is that you're, what, what I'm hearing you say is that men have less freedom in those expectations. But a lot of people would, I think, hear that and say that men have more freedom because women are confronted with this choice of, of what to do about, about children and they face these trade-offs and these compromises mm -hmm. there. And I, the assumption is, is that men want to be unencumbered and out there hustling and pursuing that career and that, and that that's, that's freedom, that's liberation. 
So how do you respond to that? First of all, we never even ask men what they want. Um, so men gener so that man sitting at the table, um, you know, watch um, when the, his wife is pregnant and the dinner party comes and, the, and everybody says, you know, Mary, what are you thinking about doing? And, um, and you know, you, you work right now very hard and you love your work. Um, are you going to be full time with your work? Are you going to be full time with the children? Are you do, do some combination of both. And oftentimes, so she generates those three options, work full time, children full time, some combination. And he's often just waiting to see what she chooses. Um, and if he, and, but in either case, he has three options too, usually. One is work full time, two is work full time, three is work full time. And, um, and so the lack of options is not freedom. Hmm. The freedom to choose among options is freedom. But it's more complex than that. When the Pew Research Center finally asked men what men who work full time, which they would prefer when the children came, would they prefer to continue working full time? Would they prefer to be with the children full time, not part time, but full time? Which would you prefer? 49% of the men said, I'd prefer to be with the children full time. Really? Yes. This is the Pew Research Center, which is probably the most respected research center in the country. But no one had ever even asked dad that question before. Now, one of the best ways to understand this in a, in a really touching way is uh, the people that understand this best are Japanese millennials who <laughs> have a game called Kuroshi. Um, Kuroshi is Japanese for death at the desk or death from overwork. And this game called Kuroshi gives each person a, a, a Kuroshi figure. And to win the game, they have to climb up and get to the top of either a corporate ladder or a religious hierarchy ladder or um, you know, any, any type of hierarchy in, um, in government, politics, and so on. And the person who finally gets to the top first, when he gets to the top, he wins. And so he commits suicide. Not in real life, but in the game. And he commits suicide because the Japanese millennials understand that being expected to climb to the top of a corporate ladder gives you less freedom to be you. It undoes you as a human being. It just made you as a human doing. And the process that it takes to, hmm. uh, to become extremely successful at work is a process that takes away your ability to listen effectively, be with the family effectively, be in touch with your feelings, share your feelings with others because you're afraid it will not lead to the promotion and the advancement, um, not talk about the, the, the risks of your business because you can't get an investor to finance it. And before you know it, you're cut off from yourself as a human being. And so the Japanese in that game represent their understanding of that by saying you're no longer, when you get to the top of that ladder, you're no longer the human being you want to be. You don't even know what you've lost about yourself because you're not enough in touch with yourself to understand what it is to be a human being. And so when we talk about the world being controlled as we do in colleges and universities, in almost every gender studies course, the theme is that we live in a world dominated by a patriarchy which made men uh, rules to benefit men at the expense of women. We didn't live in a world dominated by a patriarchy to make rules to benefit men at the, at the expense of women. We lived in a world dominated by the need to survive. And to survive, our grandparents didn't think about rights. They thought about responsibilities. They thought about obligations. Women didn't have freedom and men didn't have freedom. Women had the expectation of bearing children and raising children. Men had the expectation of killing the animals or killing the enemy or uh, raising money instead of raising children. And it's only been in the last 50 years or so in developed nations among the middle and upper middle class where there's been the freedom to open our, uh, our hearts to say to our daughters or our sons, uh, you can be anything you want to be. And that's been said to our daughters, but because we have framed the world in a way that said women were oppressed and men were the oppressors, we haven't said that to our sons nearly as much as we've said it to our daughters. We think that our sons, by going up this corporate ladder or business ladder or medical ladder, um, have more freedom um, than uh, we, and we call that power. But what men have learned to define as power 
is feeling obligated to earn money that someone else spends while we die sooner. So one of the things that is really resonant with me about what mm -hmm. you're saying is that when my son was born, I felt this real switch happen in my brain. Yes. And it was really dramatic. Mm -hmm. And no one had talked about this or prepared me for it. And mm -hmm. that was, I know you talk about this as the dad brain. I felt this reorientation in my, mm -hmm. in my ambitions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I wanted to be with my little boy and I wanted yes. to care for him. Mm -hmm. And frankly, like work lost its flavor for like mm -hmm. six months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to reestablish that balance. Mm -hmm. And there really wasn't much I could turn to for that, yes. to, for inspiration or for a sense of, well, how do I navigate these feelings of wanting to mm -hmm. spend more time at home? And mm -hmm. what you've laid out is this, these pressures mm -hmm. and, these, and these narratives. Yes. And, yes. and they're not always true, but if, let's say on average they're mm -hmm. true. Yes. For dads like me, who, or, spe or like soon to be dads, you know, what is your advice the most important first thing to do for every every man, especially a man anticipating having a child, is to educate himself. Because moms can't hear what dads don't say. You have to learn why you're going to be so important and what's going to happen to you. And the first thing that's going to happen to you is this dad brain phenomenon that is pretty much unknown in the culture. And that is that you have a whole nest of dorm, dormant neurons in your brain, which when you learn you're going to have a child and you feel that child in your, in your wife's womb um, and you begin to see that child, your brain will change. It will become oxytocin will develop inside of you. A need to protect and to care will develop inside of you. And the neur neurons that were dormant will begin to fire and connect with each other. But those neurons can be experienced in a couple of different ways. You can interpret your need when that child is born to have to go out and earn more money. So then there's a, a, div a division um, in that desire to protect and nurture and love um, is either going to be manifested by your being away from your children more, uh, the father's catch 22, that you love your children by being away from your children, or being with your children more. And you will be in a dilemma and you'll be receiving all sorts of mixed messages. You, you know, we'd love to have you be with, more with the children, but it'd be wonderful to live in a, a community that has a good school system, which happens to be more expensive than the community that doesn't. And wouldn't it be great if you earned enough money so we could move there, et cetera. Right. That's just step one. Step two is that there's a massive number of things that lead to children doing better in more than 70 different areas. By children, I mean not just boys, but girls and boys, daughters and sons, doing better when you are more involved. You know, our kids are getting these messages mm -hmm. about who's in trouble and who's not in trouble. Yes. And by and large, the stories in our culture are about the trouble that girls face, not yes. boys. Yes. Except for you and a handful of other voices. Yes. Why is that? Uh, one of the reasons is, for example, when I was on the board of directors of the National Organization for Women in New York City, we had an, an analysis, and it was a hierarchical analysis. We had been through the civil rights movement, and the, in the civil rights movement, there were legitimate oppressors and oppressed. Uh, many of the people involved in the women's movement at the beginning were Marxist in their orientation, and in Marxism, there was the oppressors and the oppressed, and the, the oppressors were the ones making a lot of money and uh, were, the, were, the, were the wealthy with the top of corporations and so on and the oppressed were the workers. And now uh, we had male-female issues and the men were making more money. Um, and they were at the top of the corporate ladders, the business ladders, the political ladders, et cetera. And so we put them in the category of the oppressors and the w women earning less money on average uh, were the oppressed. And so we started to care about women's issues and trying to get them away from being oppressed. And so we spent the last half century developing these women's issues and concerns that our girls would have opportunities that their mothers and grandmothers didn't have. Yeah. I had the same experience 
experience myself. Uh, my mother, you know, when I went to UCLA for my master's degree, uh, she started to cry and she said, you know, I, I was given a scholarship to Cornell, but I felt that I wanted to have nice things to wear um, and to be able to attract a man and to be able to be taken care of and, and raise children like you. Um, but I never made use of my talents and my heart opened up and I was completely tuned in to every woman's issue and women's um, experience of victimization. And as a result, anyone that paid attention at the early part of my feminist career, anybody that paid attention and said men also have it difficult, it wasn't until I started some 300 men's groups that I heard over and over again stories that made me realize that men, when they open up their hearts in a confidential men's group, that they have a, a, a pain and hurt and vulnerabilities that the, the normal world doesn't allow them to talk about, uh, that that is a different type of um, experience of challenges that needs to be, be paid attention to. And so during this period of time, we were paying attention to how deprived women were of the opportunity to earn significant amounts of money, but we completely missed the fact that in order for women to earn money very well and be a have-it-all woman, let's say, that it would be very helpful for that woman to be married to a man who is more of a nurturer connector uh, who would be willing to take care of the children and then she could focus on her career and so we didn't present that opportunity because we saw only the women's issues and the women being victims and we have unfortunately honed victimhood as a fine art so we've made tr a transition in the last 50 years and that's undermining women because nobody respects somebody who's a professional victim. It seems like what we have playing out with the boy crisis and with how hard it is to get that message out, even though the data is really crystal clear, that boys and men in general are in trouble along all these dimensions that you talked about, yes. is, is a subset of this bigger story and the story mm -hmm. of do we treat people as individuals and try to address them for all their potential and all of their challenges mm -hmm. at the individual level, or do we see them as members of groups? Yes. Identity. Identity yes. politics. Yes. So is that fair to say that this sort of the invisibility of the boy crisis is just another casualty of our identity politics? I'm afraid that that is not the only cause of it, but it is certainly a significant contributor. So um, I was filming like we were filming here a few months ago and a young man walked by. And I said, you know, I'm talking about young men's experience in high school. And I said, would you mind coming here for a second? And he goes, well, all right. Um, and he's, in, you know, it turns out he's in high school at a private male school in San Francisco. I said, we're, to we're talking about male-female issues and what happens in high school. And I said, you know, what do you learn in high school? And it didn't take him more than about a minute to say a number of things. One is he learned that the future is female that men in fact are part of the patriarchy and they've made rules to benefit men at the expense of women. And I said, do you feel it's that way? You know, he said, well, I, I sort of feel like when I hear the future is female, I don't really feel like anyone's paying attention to my future or cares about my future. It's not a, a message that I really like. And when I hear that men are the oppressors, I sort of feel guilty um, and a little bit hurt. Um, and left out, but so many men, and this is high school, and I hear this from junior high school boys also, and this is in an all-male school. I live in Mill Valley, and we have a school near us called Tam High, which is a public school, a very large public school, and I said to your friends at Tam High, feel the same way. I, they said they get the exact same message. It makes no difference. This is what our sons are experiencing about themselves today, and it's one of the reasons I say the boy crisis is not just a crisis of mental health, Health, physical health, economic um, health, but it's also a crisis of shame, that our boys are feeling ashamed that they are boys. You mentioned that there's no government agencies dedicated explicitly to men's health, despite men having more health problems in general and li living shorter lives in general. Yes. Um, you've also worked uh, to try to get a, 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 a White House counsel Yes. Uh, for, uh, for boys and men. Yes. So tell me about that. It started out, my involvement in this 12 years ago, when I got a call from the White House asking me to, um, I had been on, the, because I'd been on the board of NOW, and they, they were forming a White House Council on Women and Girls, they said, would you be an adv advisor to that? And I said, absolutely. I said, but there's also a need for a White House Council on Boys and Men. 
And so they said, well, I'm only authorized to ask you to be an advisor for the White House Council on Women and Girls, but if you want to draw up um, a proposal for that, um, great. So I got 30 uh, some odd of the leading experts in the country together to create a proposal to create a White House Council on Boys and Men in addition to the White House Council on Women and Girls and to work synergistically with the White House Council on Women and Girls. Long story short, it went nowhere. The Boy Scouts uh, officially endorsed it and they created a meeting with um, President Obama. Everything about the meeting was approved by Valerie Jarrett, um, one of the advisors to President Obama, but the White House Council proposal was crossed off the list and then never able to be brought back up. Skipping some years, we get to President Biden running for president. And um, President Biden promised that there would be uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So he created a gender policy council. At first, I was excited because now this is not White House Council on Women and Girls, it's Gender Policy Council. But the mandate of the Gender Policy Council was very clear. It was only to be focused on women and girls. So I had contact with the person who was the main chair of, of the Gender Policy Council, and I said, you know, we need to make sure that this Gender Policy Council is about women, girls, men, boys, fathers, et cetera, because you know, the people in the United States who have the, the biggest set of problems are black males. There's gay males, and you say that you're in favor of LGBTQ. Um, and so many of these people who are having problems are males, and you can't be in favor of, of diversity without the diversity of males, without the diversity of fathers, without the diversity of boys, and you can't call this inclusion when you're in favor of exclusion, and you can't call this equity, this is unequal. And the response is from Jen Klein, the chair of this council, oh, President uh, Biden cares a great deal about um, men and boys. He cares a great deal about dads. And that doesn't mean you can ignore men and boys and, and fathers because he's a wonderful dad. <laughs> um, he, he should be all the more tuned in to including that. And the answer was, I, I keep telling you, he cares a lot. And there's been zero. Just not enough to actually build anything uh, about uh, it. Do anything about it. And so all the things I discuss in the boy crisis, every single one of those things are ignored by the Gender Policy Council, except for things that, um, that where men should be involved to approve of feminist issues. So if you're a feminist male, um, we'll, we'll pay attention to you. But if you're a male talking about the problems that boys are having that aren't problems that are related to the problems that girls are having, you're not paid attention to. Just to recap real quick. Mm -hmm. There is a boy crisis. Yes. It manifests across basically every measurable dimension. Yes. There's historical and cultural reasons why it's not discussed in yes. the popular culture, both psychologically within men and also politically. Mm -hmm. And one manifestation is the lack of sort of government focus on it, which as someone who's skeptical of government, I, I don't mm -hmm. necessarily think that's uh, always a bad thing, like leave us alone. But all of this seems pretty reasonable. And yet you have been, you get protested when you go to speak on college campuses. There's a lot of criticism that gets piled on what's called like the men's rights movement. How do you respond to people who say this is all just sexism? The good news is that I rarely get that objection from anyone that's read the Boy Crisis book. I only get that objection from people who hear that Warren Farrell is saying that there are boys issues. That must be part of the men's rights groups. Uh, that And they are haters of women. And they are people who are MGTOW, men go their own way, or incels, involuntary celibates. And, um, and so they make that association. When in fact, um, even when I was on the board of NOW, I've always, Betty Friedan and I would frequently talk about um, how important um, men's issues were. And she even wrote her much less popular book called The Second Stage, um, as a re I think that emanated in part from our conversations that said the second stage of the women's movement should not be a women's movement. It should be a movement of both women and men changing their roles. And that evolved from our conversations in part. She has a brilliant mind of her own that basically said that 
the issue is men's and women's roles. And the way I've put it historically has been that I've never been in favor of a woman's movement criticizing in, uh, men and making men the enemy. I've never been in favor of a men's movement criticizing and making women the enemy. I've always been in favor of a gender liberation movement, freeing both sexes from the rigid roles of the past to more flexible roles for our future. Historically speaking, we played roles because roles were what most societies figured was the most efficient way to raise children and raise money. And women risked their lives raising children and men risked their lives in war to protect the children that women bore. And that was our division of roles. It was not about male privilege or female privilege. It was about the responsibilities that were needed to make sure um, that our children were protected and grew up well and able to survive and had more opportunities than than the dads and their moms had. Now, the biggest takeaway from your book is is the role of dad. If dad's in the picture, or if you're if you're about to have kids or you have very young kids and mm -hmm. you're watching this conversation, let's just talk. I want to hear like what is your advice for for that dad to combat the boy crisis with their sons. Like what, what steps do we need to be taking mm -hmm. proactively yes. to help our kids, help our sons avoid mm -hmm. being a statistic in the boy crisis? Yes, first, understand that the relationship between dad's time and dad's dime. Once a family in the United States is earning somewhere between 60 and 75, $80,000 per year, there's a switch that happens. You've basically been able, you're able to, if you move to a different place or even where you're living, you're able to have your family survive. Once your family can survive, either from the income of the mom or the dad or some combination of both, um, the children who do best are ones that have more of dad's time. And hmm. so that's an important shift to watch. It's not that survival isn't important, and you know, if you're living at $10,000 a year, there may be different types of problems. But second, study and make it your responsibility to not only understand the evolution of the dad brain, but to understand the differences between what dads do and what moms do that create a, a, a natural tension between moms and dads that, is, that should not be settled by arguments that defeat the other person's best, best intent, but need to be heard lovingly. For example, when your child says to mom, you know, can I climb the tree? And mom says, uh, well, sweetie, maybe in a few years, but right now it's kind of dangerous and you're not big enough to do that. And then the child runs to dad and says, you yeah, know, dad, can I climb the tree? And dad says, well, if you're really careful, yes, go ahead and climb the tree. And then mom says, wait a minute, I just said the opposite of that. And so then mom and dad can potentially become involved in something that I call checks and balance parenting. The first step of checks and balance parenting is recognizing that moms have an important message here, which is, don't get a concussion, don't get spinal cord injuries, and don't die when you're climbing that tree. Dads also have an important message, which is it is healthy to take risks. Risks are virtues that taken to the extreme become a vice. Um, mm -hmm. And so a good dialogue between dad and mom might be um, the mom saying, well, okay, the child can climb the tree, but not above this type of level. You got it? All right, I agree. Now what's happened there is that the child has gotten the best of both worlds. But what we don't know is what exactly was the best world that the child got from climbing the tree. Very few parenting books or magazines help the dad understand that that child that climbs the tree gets much better control of the physical and psychological functioning of the child, that, that the brain increases its synapse development, that the child's IQ increases from climb to learning how to assess risks and which risks are, are worth it and which risks aren't. And at the same time, as a result of the mom, the child is highly unlikely to get to get seriously hurt. And so it's that type of checks and balance parenting 
that leads to children doing the best. But dads, you need to do your homework to know why things like roughhousing lead to more empathetic children, why things like climbing trees lead to children being smarter and being able to assess risks more effectively. You can't expect moms to hear that you're not just neglecting the children by not paying attention to that and not communicating those contributions that you make to her. As I said before, dads, moms can't hear what dads don't say. That's really powerful. So if I don't understand what my contribution is, mm -hmm. which is not hard because we don't get a lot of messages about what our contributions yes. yeah. are as dads. We just yeah. don't hear that very much other than being a disciplinarian. I think that's the one message that tends to come through pretty loud and clear, not just from our culture, but from our own parents, mm -hmm. is that dad's role is to be the breadwinner and to be a disciplinarian. Yes. Where do we turn as dads to learn these lessons? You say, do your homework. Well, where do I start? Where do I start? Like, where's the cheat sheet? Where else can I look as a dad to try to better understand my role? Immerse yourself in the part four of the boy crisis, but particularly the chapter that talks about all the differences between dad style parenting and mom style parenting. As a dad, if you tease your child and the child ends up crying, which usually will happen, especially when you first start teasing your, your son or daughter, uh, mom's going to think of you as an insensitive dad. I don't feel safe as a mom leaving the child in your hands. You have to understand and uh, why teasing up to a point is very helpful for a child to be able to pick up nuances and to be able to laugh at himself or herself. If you don't understand that, you can't expect mom to understand that you're not, that you're being anything but sensitive. The challenge that dads have is that we do things that are quite natural to us, like the roughhousing, the teasing, and so on, but we don't understand the positive effects of what we're doing. And it's so important to have mom input because those positive effects of teasing can also become negative effects. It can become a virtue taken to its extreme that becomes a vice. Not protecting your child, making sure your child is somewhat protected can go too far. It's, it's so important to know how, what you contribute but also not to throw it in the mom's face so that you're right and she's wrong. To be able to pay attention to her contribution and to figure out a win-win situation about those, that's what will lead to your children uh, being not only benefiting from both sexes' contributions, but also letting your children hear the dialogue that results in a good outcome so they know that they and their relationships can have differences with their partner without tearing their partner down, but to building constructively a win-win situation for the children. Time and again, I hear a piece of advice. Be sure to have dinner with the family. And you say that too in the boy crisis. Why is dinner with mom, dad, and the kids so important? We do know that there is that children that have dinner with their families do better. However, there's two types of family dinner nights, and one of them is a family dinner night that evolves into a family dinner nightmare. Uh, that, um, and it often starts with the children bringing electronics to the table, and the children are dread, um, resentful a little bit about having to drop those electronics. But the dynamic behind it is oftentimes when the children start talking, the parents sort of say, well, you know, you could do this, this problem you had, you can solve it this way. Uh, you know, why are you talking about somebody taking drugs? That's terrible to take drugs. Uh, drinking alcohol, uh, swearing, doing this and that. And the children know that family dinner night is going to lead to a family dinner lecture. Um, so they're their enthusiasm for it is much less than it is for electronics. <laughs> and so the, um, but the, the family dinner night, without it becoming a family dinner nightmare, looks something like this. First is understanding that, you're, that your job as a parent is to make sure that there is a lot of listening going on. And that listening means that when the, ch the children talk, that you don't interrupt that you just hear them out, that you don't look at them with eyes of, of um, consternation and that's a problem and why are you saying that and oh boy, I'm gonna, as soon as I can, can do that, I'm gonna interrupt you and give you the right answer to the question. You let children just be heard. But parents who are good at letting children just be heard are usually parents who are high on the empathy scale. And being high on the empathy scale mm -hmm. often produces children that are not empathetic. 
because this is interesting. Yeah, be, I've be, heard about this. Because those children are not being required when dad and mom talk to listen to dad and mom in the same way that they were listened to by dad and mom. If the only thing that's happening at the family dinner night is dads and moms listening to children, children become more self-centered. And a teacher that has thought about this will often notice that um, that parent child parent parent teacher night will often lead to the children in her class in her class who are most empathetic will often be with parents who are quite requiring a lot of their children to also hear them and to consider their sisters and brothers' feelings. So it's so important that empathy not become a one-way street because the result will be self-centeredness. After reading your book, that was one of the things that stuck out to me the most, actually, mm -hmm. was that kids that have dad in their life are actually more empathetic. Yes, yes. This was, so, it's so counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. If dad's the disciplinarian and dad's the lecturous one and the demanding one and the, the teaser mm -hmm. <laughs> and the roughhouser, mm -hmm. like where does empathy come at it all? Yes, that? yes. At the dinner table, um, when they're talking, if, if, a, if, a, if the child is interrupting the sister or being demeaning to the sister or something along those lines, moms and dads will both have the same initial reaction, which is, sweetie, it's not really nice to be that way to your sister. But moms will tend to repeat that each time the brother is that way toward the sister. Dads will try sometimes say, I, I already told you, you can't treat your sister that way. If you do, um, you're no longer, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be taking your electronics away from you. Oh, you can't take my electronics away from me. Do you wanna bet? So the boundary enforcement is what tends to differ differentiate many dads from m most moms. The roughhousing example uh, is, is another good example. The dads will tend to be uh, roughhousing, and roughhousing is one of the things that leads to a greater amount of empathy. That's about as counterintuitive as you could possibly imagine. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but this has been studied by like psychologists exactly. who aren't expecting this uh, outcome, uh, right? Th that's really important because there's confirmation bias and things, but I've never known a psychologist to start studying this issue with an expectation that fathers are going to be, uh, uh, fathers' involvement and the way we are involved, like roughhousing, leads to a great, greater amount of empathy. There's not a confirmation bias in there. There's a confirmation astonishment in that process. And so to make that clear, the father and the child that are uh, children that are um, being uh, that are roughhousing together, um, almost invariably the roughhousing will get out of hand and somebody will be uh, sort of too aggressive to the other child. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, the difference between mom and dad is that moms will say, you know, you're being too rough here. And then the children go back and they're still being too rough in order to be able to win at the roughhousing. Um, and mom will repeat, uh, you shouldn't be, I just told you a minute ago uh, that you shouldn't do that. And, but there's not enough incentive in the mom's lecture to pay attention to, um, to the need to think about sister or brother's feelings about being too aggressive in order to not, um, in order to stop being aggressive like that because the child wants to win at the roughhousing and the temptation to win is, exceeds um, the, the interest in being empathetic to the sister or brother. Dads will usually say something, they won't repeat it. Uh, they may repeat it once or twice, but they'll, uh, you'll, they'll usually say, I warned you that the, there would be no more roughhousing if you did this behavior that was too aggressive, and now there's no more roughhousing until two days from now. Two days from now, the children know that if they treat their brother or sister that way again, they are going to get no more roughhousing. So they're learning that they will not get what they really want, the roughhousing, if they don't postpone the gratification of, of, of pushing their sister and brother aside in order to win at the roughhousing. So we find that the children that have that boundary enforcement on the part of dads, that that boundary enforcement leads to the children being more empathetic because they're required it's not just suggested, but they're required to think about their sister's or brother's feelings um, in order to be able to get what they want. It also teaches them postponed gratification because they have to postpone the gratification of pushing their sister or brother out of the way um, in order to have more continued um, uh, roughhousing. This all makes a lot of sense to me from my just 
just as a dad and, mm -hmm. and uh, at one level because mm -hmm. I love to tease my mm -hmm. son. <laughs> yes. Since he was little, I would take his blankie and at, at night I did, this became a ritual and I would throw it in his face. Yes. I don't yes. know why I felt compelled to do that. Mm -hmm. It's, it doesn't really make any sense. It's kind of being mean. Mm -hmm. But every time I do it, he laugh. What you are doing when you do that is you're creating a bond. You're creating a ritual. You're creating a sense that, um, and, the play, and the teasing and the playfulness um, teaches the child to be able to laugh at himself or herself. And it's very important that this bond is being created through this teasing and through this roughhousing because that bond is cashed in by a dad saying, and you, and you need to do this in order to have that happen. You need to finish your homework and you can't just sloppily go through your homework. I'm gonna take a look at it. And if that homework isn't good, there's, no good, there's not gonna be any more fun and games before bedtime. And if you come back and you don't give me that homework done well again, I'm not gonna say to you, oh, you tried, now we'll have fun. I'm gonna say to you, you need to do it better or we won't have fun. So this is where the story here gets complicated for me, and I want you to unpack this a little yes. bit because my my wife is actually more of a disciplinarian than mm -hmm, me. Mm -hmm. So I think that for some that are watching that hear these distinctions between mom and dad behavior, that, that they could take it as, well, this is just stereotypical gender roles. This is dad being a disciplinarian and mom being permissive and... Mm -hmm. So I hear these two distinctions you've made between the way dads will tend to behave, mm -hmm. especially around boundary enforcement, mm -hmm. which is an interesting way of thinking about that, enforcing boundaries. I guess I, in a sense it's discipline, but it's a specific kind of discipline. Mm -hmm. And what you're describing as sort of the way mom will tend to behave. Mm -hmm. Where are you getting these behavioral generalizations from and how prevalent is it? There are definitely many times when the, the mother can be the boundary enforcer and the dad um, can be more the uh, one, especially with a, a girl child, uh, more of the one that could be manipulated <laughs> more, more easily. The dads tend to be much less that way with their son. Uh, they tend to feel like you know he's got to grow up and be responsible and so on. So now, where, where, where does the data on this um, exist? Yeah. Uh, in, in many different examples, and I'll, I'll, many, many different studies, but here's an example of one of the studies. When children are raised predominantly by their mothers, the children have um, bedtimes that are earlier. When children are raised predominantly by dads, uh, the bedtimes for the children are later. So well, that sounds counterintuitive. Mom's, mom's forcing kids to get to bed early? Well, mom's setting an earlier bedtime. Oh, okay. But what the data shows is that the children living predominantly with dads are likely to get to bed earlier than the children living, uh, living predominantly um, with their moms. So what's the dynamic there? The children that live predominantly with their moms, the children will, uh, let's say the, the bedtime is 8.30 that the, um, um, uh, the mom set and nine o'clock that the dad set. Uh, well, when it comes to 8.30, if the child says, you know, to, to uh, moms... The negotiation um, starts. Yes. Uh, Mom, you know, I didn't get my homework done. You don't want me to go into school uh, not having my homework done. And mom is more likely, this is, again, statistical, so it's just average. Mom is more likely to say some version of, um, uh, oh, my goodness, I can't let you get into, you know, go into school tomorrow without your homework being done. I don't want you to be a failure, you know, have, and have that experience. With the dad, the dad is more likely, again, on average, to say some version of... Um, Oh, you didn't do your homework. Um, I, then you're going to have to go into school tomorrow uh, without having that homework done because you knew that the bedtime was nine o'clock. It's your responsibility to do that um, before nine o'clock. Are there other examples like that that sort of uh, underpin this uh, these differences, these sort of uh, these these boundary setting and discipline setting differences? Yes, we 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 know that that the children who um, have these, like the, the with the roughhousing, the, there's, there's good data showing that the, you know, the dads will require the children to do something like um, be uh, considerate of the other people that they're roughhousing with in order to get um, what they want to have, which is more roughhousing. And this produces also 
more postponed gratification. And there's also consequences usually when uh, when kids are playing together, like if the dad is watching kids playing and they're, they're throwing a snowball that is too hard at, at another um, neighbor or friend or sister or brother, uh, the dads will usually not just say, you can't do that. They're more likely to say, that's the end of the snowball fight if you didn't pay attention to the warning uh, that you just did that. And so again, all these are averages. Uh, that doesn't mean that many moms aren't more that way than dads, and um, that some dads will, you know, can be uh, manipulated more effectively. To wrap things up, we've got this crisis of boys, and in your book, and in this conversation, you've laid out how essential dad is. Mm -hmm. Which obviously, this is Dad Saves America, so of course we want to tell that story. That's part of why we exist, is to is to support dads. But a big part of the crisis that you lay out is how dads are absent. And the country leads the world in fatherlessness. So I know it's something like one in four American children live in a home without a biological step or adoptive father. Yes. For the single mom that's watching, and I know we've, from our comments, we've, mm -hmm. we've got moms who are watching who, want, who are trying to help fill this gap. Yes. yes. What advice do you have for the single mom of a boy mm -hmm. who's heard this story and it's like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, mm -hmm. and let's just assume that the husband cannot be pulled into the picture. What does she do? Let me start first with the possibility that the husband can be pulled into the picture okay, and, then, and, then, and then move to the next level. So the most important thing that a dad can hear is the way in which you need him. So understand that men are such that Every generation had its war, and when we told dads, that men, that they were needed, men would be willing to die so that others survive. That's how we respond to being told we're needed. Let dad know that you know exactly why he is valued. In what way does he balance out whatever your propensities are in the parenting picture? What way does he bring complementary advantages to you and create the possibility for checks and balances parenting? When you tell a dad that he's needed in that way and you appreciate the ways in which he contributes, almost every dad will perk up and respond. Hmm. What if it, you're, you're in a divorce situation? If you're in the divorce which situation- Which a lot of kids are experiencing today. If you're in a divorce situation, there are four must do's that lead to children doing almost as well in a divorce situation as in a, um, a, a intact family. Must do number one is that the children need about an equal amount of time with dad and mom. Number two is that dad and mom live within about 20 minutes drive time from each other so the children don't resent going to the other parent's house and missing the opportunity to go to a, their best friend's birthday party or missing a soccer practice and therefore not being part of the team. So that the kids stay basically in their community. Exactly, it could be the same school district, it could be, um, but about 20 minutes drive time is where the cutoff is. Number three is that the children detect, are able to detect no bad mouthing or negative body language uh, when the other parent, so no bad mouthing about the parent that's absent. This, and, is, this has got to be a hard one for, uh, for a lot of situations. Absolutely. If your children say, you know, I had a great time at dad's, and they get much less attention by saying that than saying, I had some problems with dad. Oh, really, sweetie? <laughs> you know, just those differences. Our chi uh, the children want attention like everybody else, and if they can get more of it by putting dad down or mom down, um, then the children pick up, aha, uh -huh. speaking about mom negatively is something that gives me more of dad's attention. Speaking about mom nicely gets me no attention from, da from dad's. So bad mouthing is not just bad mouthing, it's body language that, that suggests that I'm not interested in your talking positively about you know, the absent parent. Okay. Number four, going to couples communication or relationship counseling, not just in emergency situations. In emergency situations that are often time um, limited, both the father and mother are often trying to convince the therapist that their way is the right way. And that just increases the battle mentality with the mother and the father. 
but going to consistent couples communication uh, counseling gives both parents a chance to explain the best intent of what, the, uh, what they did. I didn't just leave the daughter or son at a playground um, and she or he got beaten up. I, I, if, they, if they're at the playground and they get into a fight, I want to be able to talk with that child about wh how in the future she or he can avoid uh, the red flags uh, that led to that fight. Uh, that's my way of protecting. Ah, you really do care about protecting the, our daughter or our son. You're not just more interested in the NFL playoffs than you are <laughs> in our daughter or son. And so those, those are four must-dos of um, divorces if you care about your children um, being able to um, have as good a life as they would have had in an intact family. And this is about the statistical these um, are all statistically outcomes, uh, yes. And right. The, I mean, the data for this, the footnotes for this, you can find in the Boy Crisis book. But if you just want a, an overview of that, and, and when you think about it, there, you all make common sense as well. What if I'm a, another guest we've had um, who's become a, a, a good friend, Anton Lucky. His dad was in prison. Yes. From nine months old. So mom, there was no, mom couldn't do any of that stuff. Yes. What should she do? when dad is truly out of the picture mm -hmm. and there is no amount of goodwill or effort that can bring dad in the picture. How do we, how does she, she's aware of the boy crisis and she's gotta be feeling pretty bad. Because yes. it's like, well, dad can't be in the picture, so what am I supposed to do? There's a lot, of good news is there's a lot of things you can do. So first of all, um, almost every mom and dad cares more about a son's or daughter's character than anything else. Boys who get involved in Cub Scouts for two years or more and attend consistently, their character development on all the metrics of good character, honesty, you know, et cetera, increases significantly. Hmm. But it has to be not just joining Cub Scouts, but attending significantly. Boy Scouts have deconstructed masculinity really well. And what I mean by that is they've you know, they, they encourage you to do things like, um, for which they give you merit badges. The merit badges put you in, in contact with a counselor um, who helps you do that particular phenomenon well. Uh, they've updated the, the, what those phenomenon are it's to IT and AI and other areas of, mo of, of modern um, thinking that, that would be very beneficial to your son. They develop a great deal of um, uh, um, involvement around integrity and um, being prepared and so on. This is very helpful to your son. Third, is get your son involved in a faith-based community. It doesn't make any difference what faith that is. Make sure, though, that you've checked out the faith-based leader, and that it needs to be a he, if in your son's case, and that that male leader um, brings together um, kids your son's age with other children, but boys your son age, son's age and that the boys are encouraged to talk about feelings and fears they have, hmm. uh, because it's so important for boys that tend to keep their feelings and fears to themselves. Yeah, for sure. And when they see that other boys have the same feelings and fears to the, as they do, it liberates them to express their feelings and not to feel so alone, left out, and it decreases depression, decreases the propensity to withdraw into video games and, and or become suicidal. Number four, whatever it is, is um, understand and get your son involved in the liberal, what I call the liberal arts of sports. And so in the boy crisis, I explained that there's three types of sports, all of which is important for your son to be involved in. One, the most obvious one is team sports, because it gives your, your, your son a strong male figure who requires your son to be um, able to cooperate and work with other, um, other children but usually males in an all ma and, and a male sport, and also identify who the good coaches are and talk to the coach about the fact that your son doesn't have a dad. And if that coach can just maybe pull your son aside occasionally and share with your son about what is special about him. Hmm. And so your son is beginning to hear that, wow, you know, I really, I'm, I really cooperate really well or I'm a really good goalie, or uh, I have some type of special talent, very important for your son. Second, that he not just be involved in team sports, but also get involved, particularly if your son has entrepreneurial characteristics, in pickup team sports. 
Pickup team sports are very different, and they're neglected in recent years. Yeah, the, the, the boy goes to a basketball court. There's a full court, but there's a few few kids that are there. So they decide, what do I want to play, full court or half court? When somebody says, pass the ball to me, you get a sense of, is that somebody that when that always wants to hog the sh shooting, even though they have a, no chance of making the, 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 um, the basket? Or are they somebody that is reliable when they say, pass the ball to me, are they reliable? This is all the same types of things you need to be uh, thinking about as an entrepreneur. What's a foul consist of? What are the boundaries, half court or full court? How loose are those boundaries? They went a little bit out, do you enforce it? They went a lot out, then, then obviously you enforce it. Some kids have fouling practice uh, where they learn how to foul without being detected. Is that something you want or not? And this is all, you know, in corporations, you have sort of corruption incentives or not. You have lots and lots of different ethics and moralities that get, um, that, that get developed as a result of that. So that's pickup team sports. And the third type of, t of sports is sports that require you developing, uh, having the discipline to develop yourself largely from your own motivation. Uh, tennis, gym gymnastics, swimming tend to be something that you, uh, you have a team that you can support, but you have a lot of the practices done by yourself. So these are, these are really tangible things to, to do. As we come to an end, if there's one takeaway you want people to have about the boy crisis, what is it? that the boy crisis resides where dads do not reside. We need to change the historical cultural message that dads are not just needed to kill and be killed in war. They're not just needed for money, they're needed for love. That we need dad's time even more than we need dad's dime. It's a great message. You know, so we call this channel Dad Saves America because I, I believe that these personal values that dads bring to the table ultimately create better citizens, create a kid of the future that will want to live in the kind of free society that I think constitutes what America mm -hmm. is. How do you think of your own story in the context of the American story? I think the best example I can give of that is um, Recently, I got an email from a fellow named Chris Sprells, who was Speaker of the House in the Florida, um, of the Florida House. And he read The Boy Crisis and applied it both to his three sons, but also heard a lot of other fathers sort of being interested in it, um, gave it to the political leaders in the House, and they passed a bill called the Fatherhood Crisis Bill. Um, to contribute $75 million to get fathers incentivized to know how important they were. And this, this passed the House with 100% of Democrats and 100% of Republicans. And the Republicans understood, for example, that the more involved dad is, the less involved the government needs to be. That the more involved dad is, the less likely the child is to be a criminal. About 90% of criminals are males who were not raised with significant dad involvement. That means less money being spent to, to clean up those crimes, less money need, needing to be spent on the police to be able to prevent the crimes, less money being spent on mental health problems, less money needing to be spent on prisons. Um, and so you involve dad more the money that we're spending on mental health problems, those are secondary problems. If we get dad more involved there, we now know that there are fewer mental health problems that the government has to be involved with. There are fewer people, almost about 90% of people who joined ISIS are not just males, they're dad-deprived males. Wow. And so if you think of the amount of money that we have spent on um, government programs, homeland security, think of the Patriot Act and how it limited our freedoms. But the Patriot, uh, Patriot Act was considered so necessary uh, because those freedoms we felt needed to be limited in order to prevent things like ISIS from happening. And so there is so much when a dad is involved and a boy uh, becomes a constructive citizen with goals and aspirations that that contributes to a better America with less government and stronger families. Warren, thank you for coming on the show and for sharing, you know, just a tiny sliver of all of the 
all the experience and all the the wisdom and the data that's in the boy crisis, uh, I know we'll be having many more conversations like this. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Warren Farrell. Be sure to check out his book, The Boy Crisis. We'll post the link down below. I think the biggest takeaway from Warren's work is the fact that boys really are in crisis, that most people don't realize it, and that many of our key institutions seem to actively ignore it. But I want to hear from you. Share your thoughts below, and I look forward to engaging with you in the comments. If you got value out of this conversation, the best way you can help us is to share it with your friends, subscribe to our channel, like the video, and hit that notification bell. At Dad Saves America, we believe that dads are heroes that play an essential role in the challenges we all face together. And now I leave you with a dad win we should all be proud of. As in, I will not make you pay one more dollar for anything I want.